a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Wow. Very profound. Expanding, Expanding reality. reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this episode, we have Denise Stoner. She is the co-author with Kathleen Martin on the wonderful book, The Alien Abduction Files, the most startling cases of human alien contact ever reported. Now, Denise is specialized to write on this subject because she is herself an abductee. Uh, This is a phenomenal episode, guys. Uh, Denise is one of the sweetest people I've ever talked to. Uh, she did a wonderful job on this book, and she did an incredible job here with this conversation. So for more on Denise, just look down in the show notes and all of the ways to find her, including her book, uh, will be linked down there. As far as this show goes, guys, you can find us at expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is where links to everything will be. Uh, YouTube version of this will be up on YouTube again. Uh, so without any further ado, let's just get right to it. Denise Stoner. All right, everybody, welcoming to the show, this very special episode. We have Denise Stoner with us. Denise, how are you today? I'm just fine. Thank you for having me. You are so welcome. You are absolutely lovely. We've been chatting for a little bit here, and um, I was like, we got to get on this thing because you're just incredible. I want to share you with my audience. So you and Kathleen Martin wrote an incredible book, The Alien Abduction Files, The Most Startling Cases of Human Alien Contact Ever Reported. This bad boy is awesome. You sent me a very sweetly signed copy. I really do appreciate it. I'm glad you read it. Yes. Oh, it's. Are you uh, done with it yet, or? I have thumbed through, to be fair, but I kind of save a little bit, and I do this on purpose because there is some stuff in here that I want to ask you about that I'm going to learn as the audience does. So, but for most of it, incredibly well written. You and Kathleen, like I said, did a wonderful job on that. Uh, We met through Pam Nance, and she. Yes sent me over um, your email and said, you got to, you got to talk to this lady. She's incredible. Started looking into you um, and you are incredible. So I'm (laughs) shocked that it took us this long uh, to kind of contact here. But speaking of contact, how are you? I'm doing great. Yes. And Pam's a wonderful lady, isn't she? Oh, she's delightful. She's just, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Her, and then yes. I met her through Brent Rains and I met him through uh, Barbara and Lynn Man- uh, Barbara Mango and Lynn Miller uh, through the book Convergence. And so it's this awesome chain reaction events on all of these incredible people, including yes. yourself. So <laughs> for my audience that doesn't know you, um, tell, us, um, tell us a little bit about yourself here so they can fall in love with you like I have. Oh, goodness. Okay. Well, uh, my name is Denise Stoner, and I usually work with the Mutual UFO Network, um, and I, I do investigations. I also support people who, who have been taken or claim to have been taken, help them sort through that, because at times it turns out to be paranormal or a combination of both. So I've been specializing in paranormal for that team. And so I was taken uh, from age two and a half uh, up until probably mm, maybe five years ago. And then I've only had uh, kind of a sighting of my ET during meditation. Hmm. That's it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And uh, that, so why do you think that you were contacted, taken, and then just nothing? Because people, maybe that you have been, but you don't remember, or they won't let you remember? No, I think I've done my part in whatever it was I was supposed to do. Um, And I'm seeing my ET, but I I called him my escort. He came to get me to take me to the craft and to bring me back safely. He also alleviated any pain or fear once I was on the craft by touching my forehead. And I found that's happened to 
quite a few others. Um, but this same ET has come for me since age two and a half, as I said. And now I am seeing him aging. I saw him during my meditation, and I always kind of meditate and aim to go to the same place, but I noticed he looks older. If I showed him to you and lined him up with a bunch of others just like him, you probably wouldn't tell, you know, be able to tell or be able to recognize him if I said, there's one in there that's different from all the others. That one is mine. I may be the only one that could tell. Wow, because it's so personal to you. Yes, I think so. Yes. Um, I think he was the young version of himself um, when I was two and a half. And I think that he was smaller and grew taller um, and has aged along with myself, only he's much older than I am. So tell us about him. Tell him. Tell us where he's from and how you know him. Well, he came as a, a little kind of a monk-like figure to my bedside when I was two and a half. He had a hood and long bell-shaped sleeves. Um, he was wearing what looked like a little monk, um, although I didn't have those words for him when I was that young. So uh, I looked under the hood when he came up to my bed and I could see these great big dark almond shaped eyes and he looked at me he was carrying a tool or some sort of instrument it was long and narrow with a light on the end he asked me to take his hand and I did I wasn't afraid we went out the door of my bedroom into the hall and he touched the side of the wallpaper with that instrument and we walked right through the wallpaper what was on the other side? Some sort of room. Um, and it had bench-like seats, but they were built into this metallic wall. It was all one fluid motion. And I could look down. It, it curved way around uh, where I couldn't see once it went around the corner. But at the far end, as far as I could see, I saw other children sitting there. Um, and they weren't looking at me. They were mostly in their pajamas. So I was assuming they were taken from the same area that I was on the East Coast. Um, so they were put to bed at the same time I was yeah. or close. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just but all children. All children that that time. Yes. And other times while I was young. Yes. Why, why do you think that you stepped from a room you're incredibly familiar with, with wallpaper you've seen your whole life that just dissolve into another space and you step right into something that shouldn't be there. Do you think that that was the craft or a totally separate dimension? Now, that's a good question. It did resemble other crafts that I have seen. Um, but since I stepped through the wallpaper and there was no in between, there was no standing on the ground and being lifted up. There was none of the other things that had happened to me when I got older. I just stepped through into this space. Did you notice a temperature change or uh, any of your other sense alerting you that you were just somewhere completely different smell, um, feel any of that? Yeah, um, I didn't know what it was until I got older again, but the smell was very ozone-like, and it smelled like something that was very clean without that kind of odor that you get when you buy some sort of cleanser to spray. Yeah, they're not or, using or room fabulosa. Spray. Yeah. No, no. Um, so, yes, I would have to say very ozone-like. I couldn't identify it when I was young. Um, and temperature-wise, it was absolutely equal, neutral. I wasn't too hot, wasn't too cold, just right. You know, and this is another question I've got. It's kind of what did the air feel like 
because I'm thinking whenever you, whenever they talk about these, because if we've identified it as let let's say for instance it's we're going with the craft you, because you've associated with with other crafts that that entails that it flies or that it moves through our atmosphere somehow, uh, but what that entails is is those sharp ninety degree angles that they talk about and how they talk about you know we'll apply a lot of our mental thinking to how we would react in a craft like that with our perception of how things work and we'd be you know what do they say spaghetti against the wall right you'd just be splat. <laughs> because of the G-forces. But something that's interesting about the antigravitics or however the craft operate is that they seem to affect an atmosphere inside the craft as well. They would have to. Using the same logic, we just take it past what mankind can do and say, well, there's got to be some way that some entities, if they can develop this craft and this technology, they've solve the problem of turning into splatter against the wall, right? And so that's why I was curious about what it felt like. So did, so you're saying it was completely neutral, which is another interesting perspective, because it may equalize everything so that they can traverse just at these crazy speeds and then, you know, don't end up with a bunch of splattered kids on the wall, right? Yeah, yeah, true. Um, yeah, the feeling was nothing unusual. Um, you know, I was I was a scuba diver for years and know what neutral buoyancy is. Um, and so I could relate it to that somehow. Um, it felt light. Um, thinking back on it, the various times, it, it was almost as if had I tried to jump, I might have stayed up in the air just a tad longer. That's interesting. Than yeah. we do here. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, you really get to ask somebody what a UFO smells like. That's pretty cool. Uh, and thanks for <laughs> being able to remember that. Ozone, yeah. you guys. Um, kind of, yeah. I don't know if you could make that into a candle or something just for some side hustle, you know? Boy, a, wouldn't a that be nice? Candle? Yeah, because it's from yeah. your your memory. So it's, we got to trust you on it. Uh, I would I would buy a case. So um, whenever you get those, let me know. We'll put them out to everybody else. So <laughs> what, what happened next? So you're looking around. There's a bunch of kids everywhere. How far can you remember through this process? Not very much as a child. I, I was busy observing, seeing the other children. There was another ET standing in front of them, um, kind of walking up and down. And it you know, must have been talking to them. I didn't hear any sound. And the children were all looking directly at that little ET. Um, and then the next thing I knew, he was tapping the side of a wall and I was back in my bedroom. Wow. Yeah. You know, what's, what's interesting about this is, is so you were hypnotically regressed to remember this, right? No, I, that's what I remember without any regression at all. I have had hypnosis by Kathy several times, but only to fill in some blanks. But I didn't need any blank for that. It was, I didn't have any. I was just there and I recall. This makes me smile even bigger because it's fascinating <laughs> to me that not only can you remember back that far, but also that you rem they let you is kind of the consensus on this, right? Because they yeah. don't have to let you remember anything. No. Now, do you think that it was because you were so young? How old? Two? Two and a half. Two and, and a half. You know, people, there's this. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mark. No, people want to know. You can't remember back then and you this and you that. Well, the main reason that I can is my mom was in the hospital giving birth to my sister. I was with, oops, there goes the dog. <laughs> yeah, this is a dog friendly show. I've got three it's of them in the room dog right only now. I'm, uh, I'm shocked that okay. they're not going off. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, I would have to say that the reason I recall so clearly is my mom was gone for the first time. Absolutely gone. And I think that is why I was with my grandfather and I had been downstairs looking out a window and I was watching what I now know was the craft that this entity must have come on or was sent to watch me. It was shaped like Humpty Dumpty, hmm. an egg. And that's who I thought it was in your childlike mind. I'm saying to myself, there's Humpty Dumpty. Why doesn't he have any eyes or nose or mouth? And you're speaking I was of the looking, craft. Uh, yeah, I was looking for the full feature. And this was just prior to going to bed when I was taken. And my grandfather came through. I was standing. I had climbed up on this little sofa we had. And we had a main living room and then a smaller one. And that's where I was. Well, 
my grandfather came through, I remember exactly um, what he looked like. Had a dish towel over one arm, so he must have been doing our dishes and was checking on me. And I showed him and I said, what's Humpty Dumpty doing up in the sky? <laughs> and he looked and I remember right now the fear on his face. He was afraid. Are we talking daylight here or twilight? No, it was evening. Um, it was in Hartford, Connecticut. And so it was It was also wintertime, I believe, because it was cold outside. Yeah, it gets dark but, earlier. So did you, did you see the craft physically? I mean... Yeah, and I was watching it. But it um, was dark, so was it illuminated in a certain way or was it low oh, enough? Oh, yeah. It was huge, bright. Um, and then next door to that home was nothing but an empty lot. And it is still that way today. I had someone who interviewed me um, and lived in Connecticut, went and took a picture of it for me of the house. And so the UFO descended in that lot? Yeah. Did it land and make contact? No, it was hovering. Okay. Just like it was watching me, I think. Was it what color? It was somewhere between the brightest yellow of the sun and a, almost verging on a gold, a whitish gold. Um, yeah. Any lettering or writing on the outside, such as two lines and an upside down A, which is no. just a V? I'm thinking of the Lonnie <laughs> the more the. Zamora case, uh, you know, because oh, yeah. it was an egg-shaped craft as well. That That's pretty cool, though. Um, okay, well, I'm fascinated again. So there's this thing, and I, I just heard this the other day, and so it's crazy that you even have this story, uh, because there's this thing that has to do with your age and your identity. So usually about the age, and, and people kind of argue over this as the theory goes, but psychologists have looked at this and said that from about the time you're born to 24 months, somewhere in there, you don't picture yourself as a separate entity. The example used was, is a motorcycle to a sidecar. And basically you're the sidecar. You don't see yourself as separate from your mother and it's your mother specifically. So when this was cut right there, there's this awareness point that you've got where you think on a dimensional plane at that age, because you don't feel yourself as separate from other things. You're just part of a whole, but we lose that through, you know, domestication as Don Miguel Ruiz says, but right. we, um, you know, but, but you being able to remember that, I completely believe that you could do that. There are people who remember being born and can remember yes. and verify like what their dad was wearing and stuff. It's crazy. Yes, that's true. It is. It's crazy. Um, and I think another part of it was my wallpaper in my bedroom was all nursery rhyme characters. So I was trying to relate what I was seeing out the window to, oh yeah, that's Humpty Dumpty. When I went to bed, I started looking for him in the wallpaper and he wasn't there. I didn't have him. Oh, you know, or some kind of weird Mandela effect where you went outside, saw the thing and they erased the thing from it. You know, and... This is how sneaky these little buggers are, is they could know that you, let's say you did have Humpty Dumpty on your wallpaper. I believe you did, and they made it, made it go away somehow. So let's say that you did have that, and you saw that. Well, maybe they can read your mind and turn the craft into whatever the hell they think that you'll be the most comfortable with. A Humpty Dumpty without arms and legs that or something could, like that. Yeah. So it's approachable, yeah. you know what I mean? It's a little easier. Because they can make you think that they look like whatever they want, right? Exactly. I, I think that they are capable of that, of morphing into whatever their needs are at the moment. And even their yeah. craft. I mean, because there's some arguments yeah. that um, it's, you know, organic and it's alive. You know, there's some yeah. cases like, uh, who was that that was talking about that? Uh, Adair, right? David Adair, when he went to... Um, Area 51 allegedly with his rocket and then he went into a building and it was an engine but it was alive and he felt it right yeah that's so yeah. cool uh, awesome dude so um, okay well I could just nerd out on you about uh, UFOs and stuff <laughs> forever so uh, tell me about how you met uh, Kathleen and Pam oh oh boy two separate stories all together but Kathleen um, had moved from unbeknownst to me, of course, I knew who she was, had read her books, and I held meetings down here for people who had had experiences. So I was in the midst of getting the meeting started, and this little gal walked in the door, and I thought, no, that can't be. And some people who are 
you know, known celebrities um, don't want to be advertised. So I thought maybe she wants to enjoy the meeting. So I never said a word. I allowed her to join the meeting and just experience what everyone else was. And so um, she came back the next time, which was a month later. So I went up and spoke to her and I said, you know, I, I've had an experience. So she listened and she was very fascinated with what I was telling her and what my recall was and started to take notes. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I'm not totally crazy here. <laughs> She's hearing me. So I said to her, would you like to come to lunch at my house? And she said, I would. So I invited her and maybe mm, two weeks later she came. We were sitting at the table having lunch and she was asking questions about what had happened to me through my life. And I said, you know, um, my husband saw one for the first time in broad daylight when we lived in Gunnison, Colorado. And she said, what, kind of, uh, stop, wait a minute, where? And I said, Gunnison? I said, you've never probably heard of it. She said, oh, yes, I have. When were you there? And I told her, and she said, you know, I lived down uh, the road 30 minutes from you in another nowhere town ends in mountains um, at the same time. And I am going to venture to say that we may have seen the same craft together on the same day. She was walking home from uh, work. So that's how I met Kathy. And shortly after that, she invited me to co-author the book with her. She has been my investigator, um, and she's driven almost every place, every area that you read about in that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. Just, yeah. And you oh, two together, it's, it's, of course, it's been destined. I mean, if you live like that, you saw the same craft and fizzled down, and then years ago you meet and remember that exact, that's insane. Of course, this was meant to be. It's divine timing. Uh, that's incredible. Well, uh, tell me about how you and Pam man met. Well... Sometimes, as I already mentioned, when we have experiences like UFOs and seeing entities, um, you get some paranormal things going on. Um, well, I had worked with a team. I lived in Denver for almost 20 years, and I worked with a team investigating that type of thing, people who had seen crafts up close and were now having spirits visit. So, um, with that team, I learned a lot about the paranormal and we purchased here, moved to Florida, purchased a table that was, it was from what they called the Hemingway collection and it's Caribbean hardwood. And that Caribbean hardwood table brought a little something with it. <laughs> um, I didn't see her for a while, but she was totally enthralled with documents, any kind of mail that had to do with forms and documentation. Um, so if we left, that's how we found, found out she was there. We left some mail on the table. And the next morning, we intended to pick it up, take it out, put it in the mail. It wasn't there. It was gone. Never found that. Um, then she decided she would take some of my jewelry. If I took off my earrings for the day and put them down on the table, I wasn't going to have them the next morning. Um, so one night, I was lying in bed, and I could see out through the living room, and this lady in white walked by or floated by the door, it didn't turn. She was facing where our table was in a kind of a beautiful, um, I get summary, I don't know, plantation style dress. Um, so I did get to see her. I told Kathy and she had met Pam already or knew of her. So she called her and Pam drove down here um, from the Carolinas and brought her assistant at the time with her. And they brought all kinds of gadgets and goodies, uh, some of which I own now. And um, 
they did not capture the, the woman's voice, but capture who we thought might be my husband's dad. I also thought he was in the house. Um, and a couple of uh, people who were speaking French uh, had a, said something. I, I don't have it interpreted, but um, we sat there much of an afternoon. Kathy had come over also. So all of us were sitting there trying to figure out what was going on. And in the end, I ended up not too long ago giving away the table. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. the lady of the table must have gone with it because <laughs> there's no signs of her now. <laughs> so I love this. This is reminded me because you told me about this on the phone and we were both having a really good laugh over this. So oh, yeah. it reminded me of those, one of those Reddit posts or those um, Craigslist posts where they just give stuff away. They're like, free piano. And then it says, not haunted. It says, you know, <laughs> uh, just don't want the piano anymore. Plays great. Not haunted at all. <laughs> and, you know, free. Just take it. You know? Yeah. And it's Get like it. that. So when you got rid of yours, did you, you are the kind of lady I know, though, that, that said something about it. Hey, by the way, this thing's haunted AF. Be careful. Yes. You know? Yes, absolutely. Um we actually gave it to a neighbor's daughter who bought her first home and didn't have any furniture. Oh, God. So we said, if she would like it, she's willing to take it. And she has it. Well, if she didn't have much there, there's not much for a Caribbean uh, table girl to mess up, you know? So, <laughs> no, mess not with, so right? far. Yeah. Except maybe the paperwork signing on their home. Um, right. Because or, it's that new. Or you have so, that, that drawer with all the sauces. Something keeps taking their Panda Express soy sauce, you know, and they can't find it anymore. <laughs> yeah. And that's like the extent of it. It's adorable. <laughs> that is an adorable haunting. Uh, so it it's fascinating to me, like I said, what, what you've uh, done, what you've seen. So... Tell me, if you don't mind, about one of the regressions that you had about one of your experiences with Kathleen. Uh, you document one in your book, uh, the hy the hypno regressed, um, which was at the abduction account, where um, they were doing something and it had to do with a piece of sand feeling in your eye duct. Do you remember that? I do. Um, some of the hypnosis work that Kath has done. She has given me a kind of an amnesia and we haven't gone back to explore it again. And some, I remember that I do. Um, so she will I lock parts of your understanding so that you don't have access to them because you're not ready for them? No, I was ready for everything. However, um, it, the next, my first, the first chapter is about me. And I wrote that the next chapter is about Jenny Henderson. And I had not uh, heard of her before, but Kathy thought there was a possibility we both may have been on the same craft. And she did the same thing with Jenny, just set in some amnesia so she could question us, get the answers, and then try to see if we had been in the same place at the same time. And so we think so. Um, I know Jenny. And um, she's a very, very private individual. But um, the part where I think, I don't think I know, they inserted something. They had a long tool. I saw it coming at me. I was kind of pinned down, couldn't move. I was watching, thinking, what are they going to do? And just Prior to having it inserted into my nostril, I looked and caught the sight of what looked like a white pearl, only it was very tiny, but it was pearlescent. It was not lit up, but almost, and up it went. And later on, um, I don't recall how much longer, they must have had no use for it or it ran out of steam or something because it actually came out a tear duct. Yes. And I have had sinus trouble and uh, also affected my eyes um, since then. And when, how old were you when this happened? Oh, my gosh, that I don't remember that I do not. Um, no, can't pull that one up. 
I that's just okay. remember I mean, it. Yeah, that's okay. Just to kind of establish a timeline here, but um, you're <clears throat> the the way that you described it, especially the wire over your foot. I mean, there's a whole oh, yeah. thing that happens here. Um, do you feel comfortable walking everybody through that process, just so that we can yeah. articulate a little bit about what this experience is? Yeah, from the time I was a child until, like I said, about five years ago, I was taken or visited um, sometimes into a craft. Um, I was told things, some of which I cannot bring forward. And we hold it causes pain if you try to bring it forward, not in just myself, but many others. Um it can be hypnosis. It can be an exercise you give someone to do at night during meditation to recall certain aspects of that life. And it causes quite a great deal of pain. So you stop. You don't try to bring that forward any longer. Um, so I know that I have some things throughout the years that, that I was given in the way of information. Can't get it out. I guess it's not time. Um, hopefully, one of these days it might be. Many of us feel like there's something coming. We expect something. It gets stronger um, as the years go by, and I don't know what it is. I have to wait with everybody else. But from age two and a half up till now, I've experienced uh, being used as a breeding uh, reading human for them. Um, as I got older, they saw me less and less, but also gave me this information that I can't, I can't recall. Um, so I think there are several stages. I think you agree to do this. Uh, you just don't remember whether it happened prior to this lifetime. Kind of think so. Um, because I, I research past lives, and I usually ask the person if they would allow me to check to see if they experienced any UFO sightings or ETs in that past life. And the majority of them say, yes, let's, let's look at it. What's the percentage of people that have when you finally, when you regress them? Well, this is fairly new research. So I'm going to say that out of 10, seven. See. I knew, yeah. I knew this, by the way. I, I was talking about this as somebody the other day. I, I was like, I bet you everybody has been abducted. Everyone. I mean, and then they just don't let you remember because they don't want, you know, I, I think like you, you choose this at a certain level, right? If you want to go spiritual with it, we could definitely go that route. But also in this life, subconsciously, maybe whatever they're able to tap into, you kind of agree right. to it. And then those that either don't remember it or don't want to take part of it, they've chosen to opt out of it. Now, you might still no. take part of it. They just will be like, oh, okay, well, we'll just delete your memory. You know, that's fine. We're still going to do this. Right. Um, which is something right. I do want to get into with you here in a minute. But please uh, continue about that experience experience that you had um so up through well there were times when i don't recall or it may have been quieter or i wasn't needed um but i th i had a regression done by kathy and it was a past life regression because i wanted her to check and see if i had been taken and I had seen crafts, but I, I haven't gone so far as to look at the part where I might have been taken. I was in a uh, area where there were both gold and silver mines um, in Colorado. And we saw these crafts coming up through the valley. And we were used to running, apparently, because it was lunchtime and the men had come out of the mine. We carried lunch to them and we all turned and ran up through the tailings into the mine. Rather than run home, close the doors um, and not look out, we ran into the mine. And I had a clear picture, clear vision of that. Um, and I looked at that specific lifetime because I had recall of it before, but not the part with the UFOs. Because you weren't asked the specific question. 
Right. I wow. guess. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you got to be specific. It's like, all right, what do you want to know? You got to be real specific. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Well, so this was a past life that you were able to tap into of your own. Were you male or female in that life? If you don't mind me asking. Female. Okay. And do you remember the time period or kind of the, or about? Yes. Before the sinking of the Titanic. Okay. And what about, uh, were you able to pull up any um, historical photos or anything from that area and look at any of that? I have been searching um, and I could see where an individual would run up the mine tailings. And of course, I lived in Colorado, so I can't say that I had never seen it before, but I'm looking for one specifically. Yes. And so I was thinking, because I asked Pam Nancis as well, and she said, yeah, and I could identify people that I was in a past life, in a picture yes. that she's looking at in this life. How freaking cool is this? I love this stuff. I, yes. Okay. Well, what what happened um, in a different past? Were you able to recall? Let me start here. How many past <laughs> lives? I have so many questions for you. I'm so excited <laughs> to talk to you. How many past lives have you been able to regress to? Um, I would say three. How many of Three. those were you asked the question and answered it positively that you'd seen a UFO in those? Only one, because I think that particular one was the most important and the one just prior to this. Um, and I had recall of the lifetime before I was regressed. Um, so, as a matter of fact, my middle name now was my first name back then. Okay, explain. And I've seen the gravestone. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. We got a winner. Go for it, please. Yeah. Um, well, I, I started to have some memories or I don't know if you'd call it a flashback or what. Um, when I visited a specific home in Colorado and it was actually a historic home and I walked in and was with a girlfriend. We were just looking around um, because there was going to be a tour of it later. And in through the back door uh, came a very elderly woman, um, all dressed in period costume or dress, whatever you want to call it, being guided by the elbow. She was pretty old. She walked straight through into the living room where I was standing and I recognized the dress. And so I said how nice it was to meet her, although I knew that I knew her. <laughs> she had the brightest blue eyes and looked at me as if she should have recalled who I was. But I said, if you could you wait here a minute? I, I wanted her autograph, which I have. Um, I ran out back. They had a little brochure. I grabbed it, brought it in, and she signed it. And it was just like I'd known her forever. Um, and I said, where did you get the dress? And she said, upstairs in the attic in a trunk. And I said, but you're related to her. And she said, I am. Um, and then uh, she was escorted back through the people that were there and out the back door. And I think that was as long as she could stay. But I knew that dress had been mine. Wow. There was no doubt. Um, so then I started to have several um, episodes of recalling. And it just depended on the situation. Um, I was afraid always of dying of a stroke. Well, I blamed it on the fact that I've had two double strokes when I was only 20 years old. And I thought that's that's the fear. No, it took me until, oh, gosh, maybe only five years ago to find out how she had died. And she had died of a stroke due to brain tumors alone in a hotel room in New York City. Damn. So I then thought, oh, that's silly. She's she's all right. I've had two strokes. I'm fine, but I was her. I don't think it's the stroke. I think it's the dying alone. It was, yeah, probably. You're probably right. So I looked to see what this, you know, more about this woman and 
I could see where I wanted to be remembered for one specific thing, and that was supporting women's rights. But that's not what I was known for. I was known for something else, and I kept pushing the other issue um, very strongly. Uh, was I had a very strong personality, um, but um, my name was Margaret Brown. Does that ring a bell? It should. <laughs> Molly Brown? Oh, no way. Yep. Crazy. I have absolutely no doubt. None. You're going to think I'm crazy, and I don't care anymore. I think the story's um, crazy and awesome. We think you're wonderful. Oh, I was a survivor of the Titanic. Damn. And okay. I remember it, the whole thing. So was it a sabotage by, uh, was it J.P. Morgan or Rockefeller uh, to get the Federal Reserve kicked in? I, there's that conspiracy <laughs> theory. Have you heard about there this? There is, yes. Yeah. Um, so you I don't had think an so. inside glimpse. But I mean, you may I have possibly, did. and here's the thing you can't rule out about past, time, past lives, is it's a different timeline than what you're on now. Totally. Because I mean, there's this argument to be made that, I, I don't know, I, it's just these thought experiments that go down about if if maybe all the lives that you live, like every day you shift in new realities, right? And this is just a new one I've been playing with, that you don't change things in your reality. Let's say you want to change something about yourself. Let's say you want to quit your job and go do something else. You don't quit your job and do something else in this reality. You align your energies to the reality in which that already exists. Yes. So you kind of shift yeah. constantly. It's a fun way to look at it. Uh, you, it is. You can say I'll this tell about, you how I got into this lifetime, but back, back in that one, again, I was all for women's rights, a women's advocate, and I, I wanted to, that to be in the forefront and it was difficult. Um, there's even a picture and I can't find it. And I know it was taken where I was standing outside with either the governor or somebody uh, important. And there was a wrought iron fence. And on the other side are standing all the women I supported that came that day. And they're all wearing black dresses. Damn. To show, And I know it's there. I know it's out there somewhere. I just have to find it. And um, I was, again, a kind of a noisy person as far as getting my point across. Um, when the Titanic sank, I was sitting in the room playing cards with a man who was a friend, and he died on the ship. I don't remember his name or who he was. Um, but... All the way through, standing in the lifeboat, and, and I was rowing the boat, standing up because the, I considered, weak individual crewman who was sent with us would not go back and take a few more people. Our rowboat was almost empty. Yeah, you hear those stories like that. It's tragic. Yeah. Because they were just but, scared. Oh, yeah. So, when I passed away... Um, in between lives, you have some sort of guidance, suggestions, you make the final decision. Um, I was down to two for this lifetime, down to two, and I was taken to some sort of amphitheater where there were, I can only describe it in today's vision of it, huge, huge screens, but at the same time, it looked like waterfalls. There was one on my left, one on the right, and they told me to move up to the front seat, that I had to make a decision to stay or choose one of those lifetimes. What were the two lifetimes? Was it like you and Celine Dion? I think you picked the right one. Oh, my gosh. I um, don't recall what the other one was now, but I can see it when I, when I tell you about the screen. And you jump. You literally take your spirit body and you jump into that flowing whatever it is energy water and there you are and something's there to catch you this is analogous to the fabled leap of faith maybe that's uh -huh. also what that has to do with it might um but then i was born into this lifetime damn and you're like, yes, not Celine Dion. Good deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, yeah. that is fascinating. And it's amazing to me that just even the thought experiment that you can go back and look at a picture of yourself from a past life previous, have memories that you regress to, and you can get a glimpse of them. Um, yeah. And then, you know, 
Imagine, have you, mm, I'm thinking if you can regress yourself back to one of uh, your past lives where you could find a connection to where you were influenced by you. Like, think about that. What if you were an author in a past life, like Hemingway or something, yeah. and then you read your, that material and that made you become an author, but it's really just you. Yeah. Yeah. There's, well, I had the near-death experience in the hospital, but it was different because most people are in a coma. They go into shock. Um, they're on the operating table. I was being wheeled into surgery. They were going to do exploratory surgery. I'd already had the two strokes, but there was something else not right. So as I was wheeled down the hallway, uh, I said in my head, enough of this. I don't want to do it. Are you hearing me? This is going to stop. I want out. The very instant I said I want out, I was on the ceiling. Damn. I could see the tunnel that people talk about. I could see people in the distance. Um, I know now that that is a conscious, subconscious connection that I made. And there was agreed, I'm out. Let's do it. So I was awake. Um, I was told I couldn't stay. I could not come with them just now. Couldn't see their faces, but it was a man's voice that said that to me. Put his hand, one on either side of my shoulder blades in the back, and pushed. Because I was fighting. It's like, nope, going in that tunnel, that's where I want to be. Let me in. No, pushed me. And I tumbled all the way down the hall, through those double doors, and I entered my body again through the mouth. The nurse had been trying to wake me up. I looked down and saw the body, and I got one last push, and I went, ah, the body on the table, and in I went head first, spun around, and I woke up fighting, kicking to leave again. Damn. God, the picture that paints is incredible. My God. Uh, so it, it's almost like um, that you – made an agreement or a promise or a deal or you're under a contract or something like that. And then at some point, yeah, you have, you have this power because you're an infinite being as the three theory goes. And then you're like, I'm done. I'm out. And at that point of vulnerability with your body, maybe the veil's a little bit thinner, right? You don't have as strong a bond because the life force is pretty weak at that point. So you're ejected out of this thing and your buddies are like, no, 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 man, you, you got to get back in there. You know, you gotta, <laughs> the, it's not over yet, dude. I mean, that's it. And then they shove you back in there. Um, or the that equivalent of like, take my keys. And then later you're like, no, I can drive. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. no, man, you can't drive. You got to go back. You're not yeah. done yet. Sober up. Um, well, what happened after that? I woke up and I healed. They had only given me a 20% chance to live after the surgery and told my husband, get my paperwork ready. We had a five month old daughter, um, but I just healed. Um, I'd had an experience before the surgery with a nurse who didn't look like normal nurses. Her eyes were slightly large and almond shaped. She was wearing a nurse's uniform. This was back in 1969. But she was wearing a uniform out of the 40s. Mm -hmm. Like the men in black, how they drive those crazy sedans. Yeah, she had weird little fuzzy hair on the side of that nurse's cap that wasn't normal. Um, and she leaned over and said, everything's going to be okay. This was prior to surgery. She took the sheets that had its, and Kathy has my medical jacket where this is written. I had lost of it's written violent purple fluid from everywhere. You name the orifice and it came out of there. And I hate saying that, uh. but true. She rolled up the sheets, rolled up everything that fluid was on, except for one small spot on my hospital gown and took it away. The doctor came in and said, where are the bed sheets? I need them for the lab. And, you know, we've, and I said, the nurse took them. They couldn't find her or the sheets. Ah, oh, so yeah. cool. So, yeah, they got rid of the evidence, right? Yeah. So what do, you, <laughs> what do you think that purple fluid was? I don't know. I think it had been in there and it had caused some kind of 
danger, illness, whatever to me that I was sensitive to, and they got rid of it right then and there. But there was so much damage done that the surgery was required. Um, I only have a part of my stomach and only three feet out of 22 feet of small intestine. So that had to be removed. Yeah. Okay, so unlike the UFO, that is interesting. We do not want to know what it smelled like. So um, <laughs> when do you think that you caught maybe like a space parasite from one of those space kids on the ship? No, I think it was something else. Like um, a theory, like a ectoplasm or something like that, something more paranormal? No, I, I had been taken on a tour of a ship that affected me, and I, I still can sense it when I think about it. Um, they asked me if I would like to see this one, and there are several types of crafts. This is just one. Would I like to see the operating procedure of the craft? And I said yes. So they walked me again around, and there was a room on the right, and I stepped inside, and it felt like a huge, like I was inside someone's heart. It was like a boom, 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 boom. Only everything was included in that senses, feeling, hearing. And the floor was running some sort of fluid uh, through tubes, pipes, but I could see it. And I was on a walkway because I guess I wasn't supposed to step on that. I was guided and up in front of me, I saw something, and that something had a face. The rest of it, no face, but it was biological. It was organic. It was machine-like. It was a combination of something living and not that was operating that machine. And I was allowed, they said, two or three questions. So I asked one are there more of you? It's all I could think of at the time. And it said, absolutely. We're all in touch with each other. We all know where each one of us is residing and we all belong to the same mothership. Could be spiritual, could be artificial intelligence. It's all connected. Could be hive mind type entity with uh, exceptional powers or interdimensional. I mean, all sorts of things come to yeah. mind. Yeah. So second question was, why would anyone agree to be locked into this position? You're, you're there. We, this is horrible. I felt horrible for, and it was a she, for her. And she said, do you honestly think that that living part of me stays here all the time? So I think, is she out? Can she go out of body or out of whatever this is uh, from time to time? Uh, what? What? I don't know. Wow. Almost like when you're sleeping, you know, because that's what I think happens when you sleep. Like your soul moves on, or your etheric body or whatever moves on, but you, your body needs a rest. Maybe that's what happens with this. They put it on some sort of literal autopilot and then. She goes and like hangs out on a beach somewhere. <laughs> yeah. It, it kind of reminds me of, do you remember what year this was at all or about a rough time estimate? I, I'm looking at the age I might have been, um, maybe 30s. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. So. I would... I was curious because it sounds a lot like uh, you may have come up with the first idea for uh, Ridley Scott's Alien, you know, because the mother or the <laughs> the queen is stuck in the ship because she serves a, a function, you know? Yeah. So I was in my third, maybe in the early 80s, maybe. It was either that or the 90s, one of the two, I think. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, the, the movie was made before that. Never mind. But uh, it's still a fascinating story. So let me ask you about um, these, the parts of your memory, whenever you regress that you can't really remember that you know are there, but you don't have access to yet. You know, when you were describing it, it's almost like a window of a room that you could see that something's moving around in there, but the glass is frosted and you can't look through it. But you know that right. something's there in your own psyche. So do you think that there's some sort of like time released memories or one of those things like, you know, in a movie when they're like, take this and it's like, when will I need that? And they'll say, when you need it, you'll know, you know. Kind of. Yeah, I think so. Um, because of the way I've recalled none of the events 
were attached. Right. Like, oh, this happened. Oh, then if that happened, then this happened over here. No, it was very scattered. Yeah. Like they don't want to let you remember the first five minutes and then, you know, skip over <laughs> yeah. it and do something else. It's, yeah. it's fascinating because I, I mean, one day maybe you'll just be sitting in a restaurant and you'll just have Kung Fu skills that unlock because you're going <laughs> to need them in a week so you can get limbered up, you know. Uh, it's just interesting to me how these sort of things play on the psyche. And that's been one of the biggest things that you, that, that you hear about in the abduction phenomena. Now, what I love about it is the approach that you take about, you know, really studying the physical, but also the psychological uh, toll that it takes oh, yeah. on experiencers. And you've got a huge compassionate heart anyway, but you've also just happened to have been through this stuff as well. So you, you've got a form of reference, a frame of reference. It's yeah, it's much easier to speak to people, but I can also tell, you know, we have a group over here and they're not, They've just had a dream. They've watched too many movies, read too many books. We have a group in the middle who are absolutely uh, experiencers. And then past them, I can tell, I can sense it. They want either MUFON or me or somebody to write a book, to make a movie about the story they've made up, yada, yada. Um, and those ones are easy to spot. Yeah. So why do you think uh, the abduction phenomena exists? I think it's been here for a very, very long time beyond uh, several lifetimes or more. Matter of fact, back in biblical times, um, how far before that did this happen? Um, are, might there be drawings, paintings, pictures? Yeah, that type of thing. I don't know. It's very old. Yeah. I, I've been, I, you know, not toying with, but I've been aware of the idea of the prison planet type of a thing and that us yeah. uh, were just resource to them or just some sort of livestock or maybe experiment or just some, some entertainment or something like that. Uh, yeah. I don't think we'll ever really know because of the way that they've already shown us that they can disguise themselves to be whatever they want. They can make you remember or not remember whatever they want. So therefore, anything they tell you, I mean, can't necessarily be trusted. I mean, it's just all about what resonates with you and how you feel about this personal situation right. for yourself. Right. Um, but overall, do you get a sense that they're nefarious at all, that they're out here to do us some harm or... Well, I think there are bad guys just like there are here. Um, you know, the majority of us are warlike people. Uh, we want to gain more property. Uh, we would like to gain a planet. Now we're working on Mars. Um, so we want to take, take, take. Um, so I think, yeah, that we've got those, uh, perhaps not so many in that arena as there are humans who wish to fight um, just because it's been eliminated and certain ones, they know better. They know better. Um, there's some sort of, oh gosh, what would you call it? Group of entities that are out there protecting the universe as best they can. Yeah. And it's interesting when you hear about, you know, entities contacting and because like I said, we either all could have been abducted at some point and just they make us forget or only a select few of us could be abducted. And now you're throwing into the mix different types of entities that do the abducting. Let me ask you this. Have you been abducted by the same type of entity each time? I will say yes. The um, the grays and then the one I call the doctor is more the insect. Yes, the insectoid, which you have a great picture of in the book. Right. Okay. He was very, very intelligent. Um, no emotions. Um, he just did, more of a scientist, did what he had to do, and that was that. He was done. Um, the ETs, the taller one that's my escort, very, very much, I don't want to say human, but has a soul. The smaller ETs, I think they're robots. Yes. They only moved from against the wall when they were told to, one or several at a time. Uh, twice I experienced what people would call the lizard type, the reptilian. I didn't care for it, don't like it, don't know what they're all about, and I don't want to know. <laughs> um, 
So but, you have been abducted by reptilians as well. Once. Okay. Do you, do you saw mind one going twice? That? Yeah. I was taken to some kind of craft and I know it was here in Florida. I, I just felt it in the jungle and we we had um, the air force here uh, on a couple of bases and they closed and it's just all grown over with vines. Well, I haven't gone to look. I'm not sure where to look, but I was taken to an old hangar that belonged to the Air Force. And there was a huge craft over the open roof. And we were taken in there, um, sat at tables, and there was some kind of lecture given by a reptilian wearing a military jacket. No insignia, so I couldn't tell you from where, uh, what military uh, area. Kind of like a reptilian TED talk. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking uh, with another human in uniform. In military uniform? Yes. Were they wearing the same type of uniform? Yes. Or you could just, were the they same. earth uniforms? Yes. Yeah. Were you, when, whenever they came to get you, you said, um, just back a little bit here, did you, did they physically just come grab you or were you asleep and you were abducted that way? Uh, sometimes I was just told we're going to go now. And I went, um, sometimes they took me and I didn't realize what was going on until I was in the craft, uh, all variety. And I was just curious about how they got you from where you were. Uh, the reptilian specifically to the craft with the TED talk with the two military people. Oh, those, that was weird. Cause I was on some kind of, well, I don't want to say motorcycle be because it floated. Um, I was t taken by some kind of craft that they had put on one of those. And I was on it through the jungle. Like open air. Yeah. Did, did yeah. you, did it make a sound like an engine? No. No, only leaves blowing and wherever the whooshing of this unit, whatever it was, caused when it went by. Cool. Um, I'm thinking yeah. of those things in Star Wars, you know, when the Ewoks. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, this was different from that. So, what, um, so you recognized a reptilian uh, and a human being. Uh, do you remember Caucasian or what nationality? Do you remember? Uh, you mean the human one? Yes, the human military was um, Caucasian. Okay. And this was yeah. in Florida. Yeah, yep. this is. I'm this pretty is sure. Crazy. I can't tell you guaranteed, but it, yeah. well, nobody can guarantee anything. I mean, this yeah. could all be fake, right? We could be brains <laughs> in a vat somewhere, nah. just getting electrodes plugged to us to simulate reality to tell us something's happening. Yeah. Um, it, so what happened after uh, they were taken aboard the craft? I'm just fascinated by the reptilian thing for some reason, and why? Also, because it marries with another uh, more benevolent force. There was some sort of lecture given. He had what looked like a uh, clipboard with any, he, he was uh, holding it up and reading. And there were other uh, humans in at the end of the table with us. And he was reading something. I have no recall. What did your dad do for a living? <laughs> he worked at the same place that Stanton Friedman worked for Aerojet general uh -huh. in California. Yeah. Just interesting. That's all. This is interesting. Yeah. Stan Friedman wrote a wonderful forward for your book, by the way. That's so cool. Oh, yes. Uh, great yeah. man. We miss you, Stan. Um, yeah, we do. So I, I tell you what, this this one's gone long uh, for us normally, but I I think you're wonderful, of course. I think that this was so much fun. I have yes, uh, it was. a ton more things to ask you, but I'm going to have you back okay. on. So I'm oh, going to be doing some panel wonderful. stuff, and I want to include you on that. I think that that would be a ton of fun. You're an absolute delight, Denise. Oh, and thank you. It's been enjoyable. Good host. Oh, it helps us much. say what we have to say. I, no, you guys are fantastic, and I, I'm just fascinated <laughs> by this. Your book, of course, is wonderful. I will be linking it down in the show notes. You guys, go check this thing out. Uh, it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Denise Stoner, thank you so much. Thank you. 
could not be more grateful for Denise Stoner spending some of her time with us on the show today. Uh, check the links below, guys, to find her book, The Alien Abduction Files, the most startling cases of human alien contact ever reported, co-written by Kathleen Martin. Now, Kathleen has her own story. You guys go look her up uh, because she's coming on in a couple of weeks. So we're having Kathleen come on as well. It's uh, the part of the whole uh, Brent Rains, uh, Pam Nance, Denise Stoner. Everybody's just kind of in this amazing group together. And they've all been so sweet about coming on the show and telling their stories. So um, look forward to that as well. So the music that you're hearing underneath this, guys, is a good friend of mine, Vinny the Saint. Check the show notes down there for his link to find him and his music as well. Uh, also, the website will be linked down there too. So expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is where the links to all of the socials will be found. And that's how you can do that. So go out into this wonderful week in this beautiful place that we live, guys, and make sure to pick up a piece of litter. Uh, go ahead and get out of that left-hand lane. You're being a pain in the ass and you know it. Um, go ahead and buy a coffee or a water or a meal or something for somebody in line behind you or next to you or in your direct vicinity. Uh, it goes a long way. It's something super, super small, but it makes massive ripples uh, in the universe. So uh, make sure to take yourself up on that opportunity, uh, as well as just go out into this beautiful place, guys, above all and anything. And y'all just be good to one another. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>